I was listening to the birds. The birds are here. The birds are everywhere. There are lots of birds. Even if you live in some kind of big city, there most likely are birds. And you know something? They spend a lot of time making lots of noise. I, being from the New York City area, recently came back from New York City, and there is a lot of noise there. And in fact, <laughs> it's a funny little thing, but many people in New York City go out to the countryside and they say, I had such a hard time sleeping. It was so loud. <laughs> New York is loud. New York has people yelling. New York has people arguing. New York has people yelling, get out of the way. And there's taxis, there's ambulances, there's police cars, there's honking, there's traffic, there's all that kind of stuff. Yes, New York is a loud place, and yet the New York City folks go out to the countryside and they have a hard time at nighttime sleeping because the countryside is so damn loud. <laughs> what does this have to do with you? Birds are trying to attract a mate. They are also trying to warn their clan if there's some type of owl or something, you know, some oppressor nearby. Beware, beware. And they are making their noises. And often you can hear the beautiful ones. You know the beautiful ones. You take a look and you say, wow, cool. You're giving it a listen. And then you focus right in. And it's beautiful. It's unique. It's mellifluous. It is enchanting. And you can just zero in on that and block out everything else. And then you are just there. You are there. And you are focused. And you're listening. And you can hear. And you wait for that bird. Because there might be a whole bunch of birds you are hearing a bunch of birds and yet you then wait and you will hear that same bird again and you will be glad you will be happy it's satisfying because you have focused in on something worth focusing in on because the delivery was unique You know what I'm talking about. Now let's go to the opposite side of things. Let's go to some ball game. You walk through the entranceway into some stadium or into some, I don't know, some tournament, some competition, some know, arena. And all of the noise is just a din it is just a low-level, generic rumble of everybody, and you can't parse any of that. You don't even want to. It's not interesting. You wouldn't do it even if you could, because that stuff is bland, and you know what it is, and you know that it's not necessary to focus. So all you do is tune into your own little crew. There's nothing wrong with tuning into your own little crew. You deserve to find your crew. You deserve to find your tribe, your bunch of people, the folks that want to offer something that sets apart from all of the rest. The beautiful, unique lovely, melodic, mellifluous, enchanting call of some bird that stands out, of any noise, of any noise that we, as humans, one of the animals out here, feels compelled to stand up and say, listen to me. Hey, everybody. I have a great idea. And if you make that 
generic. It falls into the white noise din of all of the other stuff out there. How sad. How tragic. <laughs> Why would you do that? If you have a good idea, if you think that you have a good idea, if you believe and know that what you have is something that can be offered in a badass way, why, why would you choose to make it bland and generic and let it wallow, fall into the void and quietly die a slow painless, maybe painful, death. <laughs> hey, Lisa, what's happening? Yeah, living in a high rise in Vegas, no birds. And yet you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Because you can go out into the countryside just outside of Vegas to any any place. It doesn't have to be Red Rocks. It can just be out in the boulders out there. Or like I did, where every each time I performed in Vegas, before my show, the day of my show, I came to the other guys in the crew and said, I'm going to jump out of a plane in a little while. And they said, well, can't you... Can't you do it tomorrow after our gig? I said, what's the difference? It's either today before this gig or it's tomorrow before the gigs in the next town. And they said, you got a good point. I hope you don't die. Have fun. <laughs> and when you go out into the countryside, into the desert, into the high desert, like the high desert of New Mexico, where I spent a summer working, running up pie shop in the middle of pie town the middle of pie town pie town is a town of 50 people but the fact is that when you go out there it's not necessarily the bird sounds that i know from someplace else but it is it is there and you know the difference the unique the compelling the powerful is fundamentally different from the generic, the sad, the bland, the lackluster, the sorry excuse for content that passes for acceptable in this online space because it's all about that templated bullshit. Let's see. But concerts across the street is badass. Yes, Vegas nature is fabulous. Go Elvis, right? The flying Elvi. <laughs> I wonder if you could get married among the flying Elvi. You can certainly get married by Elvis in one of the uh, in any one of the chapels, right? So yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's one of the things that makes Vegas special. Vegas is a fascinating, strange, interesting town. And you know... There's all of those performances that are in the big, you know, in the big casinos. And each time we were asked to perform, we were invited to perform. We performed at the venues that are the performing arts centers in town for the people who live there, not for the people who are the tourists going to the casinos. And that makes a whole different type of thing. Must I, shall I, should I, ought I quote Walt Whitman to sound your barbaric yawp o'er the rooftops of the world? Your barbaric yawp. What a chunk of poetry. Wow. That guy created so many poems and made new versions of one book most of his life. He just kept naming the book Leaves of Grass, version one, version two, version three, version four, and Leaves of Grass had new content 
but it was always named the same thing because he didn't have to create a new book. He just kept making new badass versions of the same book with new badass poetry that brilliantly exhorted people to take action. And that, right. <laughs> Yeah, Dead Poet Society. Exactly. Oh, Captain, my Captain. And all of that. And it's all about the action. It's all about what Audre Lorde referred to. the, the How she called herself a black lesbian warrior poet. Mm. And she said, she challenged you and everybody out there. She challenged us, court yourself out. It's all within the same. It's all under the umbrella of massive uniqueness, of video in this particular case, video presentational authenticity plus badassery that gets you out of your own fucking way so that you can say what you truly mean from the depths of your soul. And this, this, this is what we were meant to do. To extract everything we have going for us as individuals on this planet for the brief period that we join in this mortal coil. So that we can say anything that we truly believe. Just like Gordon... You are very funny. <laughs> so that we can do it as only we can. You are unique. You are unlike anyone else. And yet here we are in this online space, this fascinating business conundrum where the people who don't know how to teach you to extract your own uniqueness need to offer you something that shows you how to get started and because they must make money by teaching what they actually can teach instead of trying to as a charlatan teach you shit they can't possibly know how to do like this so they resort to offering you scripted templated god-awful fucking banal vapid crap Tis a shame. I've got nothing against those people. They have to attempt to entice you to do what they believe is important, and what they believe is important may even be important. However, scripted templates, please, please. And that's why, yeah, Love the birds. Thank you, my fine friend. Crack me up. Love it. Very funny. Very unique. This is what I've been teaching people since 1987. Yes, I'm a geezer. Old man rivers and a goddamn mule. Get away from my lawn, you crazy kids. <laughs> yes, we don't like scripts. Right. We can smell that shit a mile away. You know a script. You know that templated crap. It's coming at you as if they... As if it's something new. Even the hero's journey, I mean, I got nothing against... I got nothing against Russell Brunson. The guy's done a lot of good for a lot of people. But Russell Brunson and what's the guy, uh, Don Donald Miller? Is that what his name is? You know, it was, uh, you know, they're they're 
tip of the iceberg cliff notes horseshit that is the teeny little scraping the top of Joseph Campbell's massive, profound information on Hero with a Thousand Faces, condensing stuff into a cliff notes version of the hero's journey means that everybody ends up saying something that sounds like everyone else. It's going to end up being that way until you get off the ground and start to do your own shit. You deserve to be able to learn how to unlock and unleash your own. What's your take on signature talks? They can really tank. Unless fabulous. Yeah, right. Yeah, and Tony Robbins. Sure, all these things. So... Seeing is how you're asking. Oh, Chaim, my man. Thank you very much. Truly my pleasure. I've, you know, about face dancing, I've been doing what I do and calling it face dancing since 1987 because... I fell into describing this. I don't even know if it was me or a friend who suggested that that was what this is, this neck up work that I do. I just know that I kept getting, I was auditioning for people's dance performance and they said often enough, I can't hire you to be in the core because I have a whole bunch of people who need to look like each other. And if you are on stage with everybody, everybody in the audience will be looking at you. <laughs> so I either have to not hire you or I have to create a solo for you. And I said, well, you know, I'm a big fan of you hiring me and creating a solo uh, and allowing me to do that. But I get it. I get it. So I ended up making my own performance company and hiring myself. <laughs> And I've been doing shit my way, on my terms, by my standards, with whom I want, when I want, the way I want it for most of my adult life. I'm glad. I'm happy. I like that. And I've been teaching people how to do their own stuff, their own way, the same thing with their own terms, in order to liberate themselves, not only in business, but in your own way of life. So that you can be a beacon to your family, your friends, your colleagues, your peers, and all of your future potential clients by extracting and unleashing your own version of what I offer. So, going back into this about the concept of signature talks, there are people out there who do signature talks like. Hmm, Sir Kenneth Robinson, fantastic, fantastic TED Talk. I'm not talking about TEDx stuff. I don't know from TEDx much. TEDx is an amateur version of TED. It's a local version of TED. And it got licensed, and that was very smart of TED to do. Ah, TED, hey, <laughs> shall I call you Theodore, or is it TED? <laughs> uh Tech, uh, tech entertainment design, tech education design. Is that a TED, TED talk? And so Ken Robinson did a really badass one. And there are signature things, but I don't think that anybody who does anything that actually extracts and unleashes individualized, unique badassery is attempting to do that. No. They are attempting to channel a unique, passionate way of extruding essential information in a compelling enough way in the amount of time that Ted gave them. So Ted might give them four minutes, in which case, fuck yeah, you got to bring it big. Or maybe some people, Ted asks, you know, Ted says you got 12 and some people you got 17, but that's the format. So 
something that is condensed. When I performed on the Letterman show, we had a great, great piece that we could do it in about four minutes and 45 seconds. That was quick. And that was a standing O piece that we did at the end of our show. And we knew it. I knew it. It was a standing O show. And the folks at the Letterman show said, um, uh, say his name again, Ken Robinson. Yes. Yeah. Is that who you're talking about? Yeah. Sir Kenneth Robinson. Oh, his Ted talk is so good. Uh, uh, do schools kill creativity do or something like that has education killed creativity. It, it's, it's great. It's great. So the Letterman show came to me and said, look, uh, your piece is really good and we want it on the show. And, um, by the way, can you do it in four minutes? And I said, uh, wow, never done it in four minutes. It's really, really good at 445. Maybe we can get it down to four and a half. And they said, um, I'll tell you what. You can make it as long or short as you want. We're not going to tell you to make it four minutes. What I will tell you is this. If you make it four minutes, I guarantee the whole thing will get on the show. But if it's longer than that, you may have a great piece where the last section is cut off or we scroll the credits during the end of your thing. So that's up to you. It is going out to over 40 million people, by the way. I'm just saying four minutes is a thing. So we worked our asses off to turn a badass four minutes and 45 seconds or four and a half into a four minute piece. And in so doing, we had to edit something we knew and loved and turn it to something even shorter. And we did so. It was good. It worked. It didn't need to be four minutes and 45. We did go back to four minutes, you know, four forty-five or four and a half after the Letterman show. But and that's just because we knew what we were familiar with. Paring it down to something essential is the same as Ted coming to somebody and saying, bring it big, you got six minutes. And then they have to practice that shit. They have to work really hard. Edit out everything that is unnecessary. I'll leave you with this. Right. That's why TikTok has gone crazy. Yeah. Nail, nail something in you know, 60 seconds. Right. And that's also why certain things are, you know, certain things have their appeal. And I may indeed venture into the TikTok world. I've managed to monetize my Facebook group from the time it was 150, 200 people. Now my group's up to, I don't know, around 850 people. That's a very good thing. But um, I'll leave you with this. There was a famous choreographer who was asked by a new young up-and-coming dancer, how do you make a great piece? You say, well, if you want to make a great piece of dance, this is how you do it. You make your dance. Just make a big chunk of art. Then remove everything that's unnecessary. And then cut it in half. <laughs> I'm not saying it's easy to do. I'm saying that when you do that, you will indeed have worked hard to ensure that you only keep what's necessary. Having offered you these few little chunks of information, along with some story insights into my life, I'll tell you this. 
I've been teaching, I have no idea how many thousands of people in well over 35 countries for a very long time how to do what I do here. Now, this particular thing is 25 minutes long. That's because this particular live free form notion has that going for it. And yet, my specialty is the short stuff. Teaching people how to do a badass short thing. There's a method. There's a process. And there is an invested outside eye, yours truly, that is brought to bear upon your work so that you can say exactly what you mean the way you want to. That's where people like me come in. And my wife is now telling me it is time for dinner here near the beach on the north coast of Denmark, north coast of Schellen at our little summer house. Speak again tomorrow. See you soon. Go get them. Adios.